Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Okay, what are we talking about today? Oh, uh, well, I wanted to start with a classic question. Stories are soul food. Here Stories we are. Stories are soul food. Here another, we are with another our souls. episode. Hungry for food. Yep. I wanted to know, That's Nate. That's my iced coffee rattling, by the way. Mm, sounds good. Sound effect. Yeah, with the extra smoke in the air, you need some here in Idaho. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite animal? I want to talk Ooh. animals. Ooh. The theme of this episode is, animals. is you live in a fantasy world, as do I. We all live in a fantasy world. That's really tough. Which is kind of, yeah. I think, honestly, man, that's real tough. But I'll just, I'll spit some things out. Definitely dragonfly. Okay. Is up there. See, interesting you go with insects because I wanted to be an entomologist when I was a little kid. Like that was what. Which is why I went insects. I did that for you. Oh, thank you, Nate. I thought, what does Brian know the most about and have a predisposition to like? Let's go to insects. (laughs) That's it. Uh, yeah, dragonflies are phenomenal. They're amazing. Yeah, so, so that you think they're better than you know the typical wolf, eagle answer that most would give tiger. Oh, I, I mean, those are great. I like big mammals. Also, yeah. I like scary mammals. I like predators. I like prey. But the dragonfly is is uh, an example, one of many of God showing off differently. Yeah, and there's. Give us some dragonfly fla- facts, because I don't think other people, most people can't catch a dragonfly, so you don't really know what it looks like, but occasionally- You, you weaklings. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, true, though. Oh, they're, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. You um, have to commit to catching so a dragonfly. So, dragonflies have, first off, and this, this is what I mean by God showing off, you have an underwater nymph form, right? So, it's, you're going through a life cycle that's similar to a butterfly with the, you know, you have- right. Full metamorphosis. You're it's gonna, supposed to be just from the stories. Yeah, we're going to do a significant metamorphosis, but it's not quite the same. It's not, it's not quite full in the same oh, way. I don't not? know that it's technically full because they don't liquefy. Oh, oh, okay. But you have nymphs that are underwater submarines swimming around eating baby mosquitoes. That's what they do. So you already like them. Right. Um, they've got these big jaws that they can unhinge and they gulp up all the baby skeeters. And they're jet propelled by gulping that water and firing it out their backsides. <laughs> so they swim by means of their uh, jet propulsion out of their hineys. And that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's tacky. And God did it. It's not my fault. Argu- and, and it also makes sense. If you were to try to design something that way, that's the most simple <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that they can swivel their abdomens around and direct and swim with direction and purpose via that is hilarious. And there's like a salad of mosquito but also, over there. But also, it also has to happen if you think about the fact that they're, they're eating underwater, they're gulping things up. Like, what do you have to, what are you going to do with this water? It's like, well, you're going to propel yourself. You're going to swim around. So they're jet propelled and they're eating baby mosquitoes and they're pretty cool looking and they can bite you. They won't really, but they could. They've got big, powerful jaws. And then eventually, they decide one day, for some unknown reason, it's baked inside them that they're going to crawl out of the water and die. Mm. Like they're going to just crawl up a blade of grass. They're going to crawl up on the dock. The sun's going to harden their casing and their back is going to split open. And they're going to crawl out of themselves. And they a dragonfly crawls out yeah so here's this a jet propelled submarine climbs up a a reed hardens and splits open and then a dragonfly crawls out of the inside and those dragonfly wings unfold and those dragonfly wings are not foldable right they cannot be folded they're really rigid and brittle and they would break so they unfold and harden in the sun, and they'll never fold again. Like they're yeah, soft. Yeah, because they uh, what do they do? They squeeze blood into it to inflate it. I think. Yep, they, they inflate it, and then the sun kind of cures it and hardens it. Now they have rigid wings, but these wings are soft and deflated. And then they unfold. Their abdomen unrolls. That long, famous dragonfly abdomen 
yeah. unspools from inside of this jet propelled submarine. They sit there in the sun and let their wings harden and get used to the abdomen. And then they fly off and they fly off with functionally like a piston engine. Now this is metaphorical. So they now functionally have a piston to each wing. And so you move from jet propelled submarine to a piston engine chopper. Yeah. In the same being. And they can fly frontwards, backwards, side to side. They fly differently because of their four wings and the way they can fire them. They're not flapping like a bird flaps. They're not flying like butterflies or not. They're flying very much in their own, their own unique physics, yeah. their own unique aerodynamic approach. Do you know about the speed? They seem like the oh, swiftest. They've been, they've been clocked over rivers. I think it was in Central America, Central or South America. They've been clocked going more than 60. More than 60 miles per hour? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's so fast. I mean, I know they're fast, but I had no idea yeah. they're that fast. <laughs> and then, so that's i'll go fact check that later but yes yeah um i know i've read that i know i've i've know yeah. i've read that article talking about it and that they were clocked going more than 60 were they using wind or not i don't know it's kind of like orb weaver spiders down there also that will, my favorite animal which are amazing yeah um uh, that have built webs over entire rivers so it's yeah they go fast and then you think about the fact that we have fossils of dragonflies that had three foot wingspans and bigger Right. And then you think, holy cannoli. Like, right. That's, we're dealing with these little guys going 60 down river systems. Yeah, because the three foot one couldn't exist now because oxygen. Says who? Well. Uh, says who, Brian? I don't says think. Says who? Says Gordon. I don't believe him. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to take that up with your uncle. But, but the oxygen rich, if, if before the flood were more oxygen rich, then you get bigger insects because they have that sort of, the, the air just works their way in. They don't breathe. They've got the tubes that stick to the outside. Right. So, the, so that's, that seems to be, if we had, you know, a nice canopy of cloud around the entire world before the flood, an extremely rich oxygen innated environment, and that's how you get those big guys. Sure, I can, I can believe that. And yet I think there's a way. We can, you still think they could be there? I still think we can do it. Well, they just need some sort of, you know, breathing ability, lung. A little sure. bit of lung related and we're, and sure. we're good with the three so, foot one. But they, we do have fossils for giant dragonflies, which is also awesome, which means that nymph, that underwater nymph you'd be dealing with would be like the size of a football or a little bigger. Yikes. Swimming around. Looking for toes. Yeah. <laughs> looking for anything to eat and probably eating fish and all sorts of stuff. And the bigger ones would be eating birds. And then, so you have dragonflies that will grab, grab insects out of the air and hang on to them and fly around a little more or immediately strip them down and eat them right there. Um, my uncle tells a story about one of the coolest things he's ever seen was looking up and seeing a dragonfly take a yellow jacket out of the air right above him. And the dragonfly hit it so hard that he heard the impact. <laughs> so he looked up, there's a yellow jacket, then there was like thwack. This dragonfly <laughs> just, just grabbed it and he stood there and the dragonfly pulled that thing to pieces and just like, he was like shucking corn and a little yellow jacket exoskeleton came tumbling down as he just ate the good parts and then took off again. Zoom, zoom. Yeah. And then we add to this the fact that they can see 360 degrees, that their vision is 360 at all times. Hence why they're very difficult to capture. <laughs> yeah. So their vision is, their vision is 360. They can move, like I said, forwards, backwards, side to side while always moving in a direction that they are looking. Yeah. So they're not, you know, beeping and backing up and checking the rear view. They actually can just see all directions. So dragonflies are spectacular and, and gorgeous. Don't they make that big basket out of their legs? So that's how they catch the flying creatures yeah. when they're bigger. Yeah. Like so they spiked can spiked basket. <laughs> yeah. So they have the amazing spikes, harpoons, and they impale things and hold it, hold it away from their body, you know, just kind of, but under their belly. So they're not getting stung by the yellow jacket, but yeah, they're still but thwack, snacking just on Just hit it. that thing, just snacking on the yellow jacket. I also have many great dragonfly stories, but one of my favorites is we already knew my oldest son was weird in, in good ways. And I've, I've talked about him in my nonfiction and Tilt a Whirl and Death by Living. He's the, he's the kid who, you know, at two was touching butterflies and stuff when he would tell me he wanted to hold the butterfly. And I, would, I said, you can't, it's fast. It's, you know, you're a toddler. And he, ex he explained to me without fussing, without complaining. He's like, no, I, I want, I want to hold it. 
And I was like, but buddy, you can't, it's not going to happen. And then the, the butterfly just turns around, comes and lands on his shoulder. And he just stands there staring at it, has a nice little moment. The butterfly flies away. And he says, I want to hold it again. And I was like, oh man, it's like, just be grateful that that just happened. That's amazing. <laughs> you already made me look stupid. The butterfly flew away like 200 yards away across a park. And I was actually just watching it go, and he was watching it go, saying, I want to hold it again. I was like, you know what, man? Don't be so greedy. And then the butterfly turned around and came back and landed on him again. And Is that one of those big tiger swallowtails? Uh, it was, yeah. Yeah. I think so. But it was- it Two was, times, though. Yeah. And then it was, I think it was, it might not have been a tiger swallowtail. I'm trying to remember the, the exact coloration, because it was faster than that. It was, mm. a, it was like a weird- fast one that i hadn't seen often but is that size big one and uh so yeah twice it landed on him he didn't have any flowers on his shirt or anything he was just you know wearing a normal solid colored shirt a two-year-old yeah and um that's always been kind of the the way when i was writing i was writing a book and he came over to my desk and asked if he could hold a bird and i, I laughed at him and said sure go go catch one and it was like 15 minutes later he came in holding a bird <laughs> A live bird, uninjured. And I was like, how did you get that? He was like, I walked over and picked it up. That's funny. Yeah. So anyway, he's weird. But we were at an arboretum and my daughter was trying to touch damselflies. And Rory, my son, already had. He'd already, of course, immediately grabbed a damselfly and was holding a damselfly, which is like a junior varsity version of a dragonfly. Similar design features, similar, uh, you know, engineering and artistry. but. Smaller and nicer. Smaller, nicer, much slower, you know. Yeah. More bendy. Their wings go back. <laughs> yeah. Instead of side to side. But they're still super cool. And you'll see them around a lot of ponds and stuff. But uh, he was holding them and touching them and catching them and stuff. And my daughter was not. And she really wanted to touch one. And then she fibbed. And she told me that she had. And I was like, I know you. I know you didn't. Because I speak lies fluently. <laughs> and so... I was like, I know that didn't happen. It turns out she'd picked a blade of grass that had had a damselfly on it. She was kind of wanting to count that. But it was mostly, I, that's great, but she was mostly trying to psych herself into having touched it. Like she was trying to believe it. Like she was trying to get herself there. She was very young. So we talked through it and we talked about lies and falsehood and just being grateful what you're given. And Rory was in his own zone, ignoring all of this, unaware that any of it happened, just processing things. And as we were walking back to the car, he uh, realized that his little sister was sad and she was sad a because she hadn't touched a damsel fly, but B because she had lied and been bad and was now feeling horribly guilty and hadn't touched a damsel fly. The twofer. Yeah. So <laughs> we're getting, we're getting to the car and he realizes that she's sad and it's like, what's, what's going on? And we're now away from the ponds and away from the plants and every, you know, everything else. We're now down in the parking lot. And he realizes she wanted to touch a, a damselfly, but she really wanted to touch a dragonfly, a dragonfly. But uh, <laughs> she really wanted to touch a dragonfly, but to her, they were all the same, damselflies and dragonflies. And he said, oh, and kind of in surprise, just stopped by the car and turned and looked around. And in one of the weirdest moments I've ever seen, uh, he looked around and spotted one about 50 yards away above a barn down by the parking lot and just stood there and the dragonfly swooped down and landed on his shirt big huge black dragonfly just landed on him and so he picked it up with his hand and set it in his sister's hands awesome and said there's something wrong with its eye mm -hmm. it's like it's it's having trouble seeing and i was like what <laughs> yeah and i got in there and i like lean way in i was i was blown away by this and i looked in tight and sure enough he had a little ding in his compound eye on one side a little damage yeah i was just like okay this kid's weird but his That's sister awesome. was very happy she got to hold this ginormous jet ski looking dragonfly yeah. yeah and then it took off and she got into the car very happy and rory acted like Nothing weird had happened at all. <laughs> He'd <laughs> at, summoned a dragonfly. At all. He went nothing. Gandalf on a dragonfly. <laughs> yeah, <No. it's>, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there was nothing strange about this whatsoever. The also the first, for example, my uncle has been looking for rubber boas for a long time, and the first time I went out with him and with Rory, 
Rory found a rubber boa the f- like first try up on the mountain. You know, it's like this is my uncle's been doing this for decades. But yeah. But that's also unique to his story. He said that people find rubber boas around him all the time and he never does. It's just a, <laughs> it's a special it's a special sanctification thing that God's doing for my uncle. The herpetologist yeah. cannot find <laughs> a rubber, rubber boa. boa. <laughs> but people bring them to him whenever they do. He's like, "Yep, that's a rubber boa." <laughs> <laughs> now that reminds me of yeah, my oldest always they'll come in when they're two and they just flipped a rock and they've got a garter, a baby yeah. garter, you know, that kind of thing or yeah. and um, they're covered in yeah. musk. Yeah, exactly. But the thing, so insects, obviously awesome. Yeah. And, and your writing about animals reminds me of, of Annie Dillard. Oh, good. But Annie Dillard can't handle the fact that there's so much awfulness in an insect life. Because as soon as you start looking at insects, you realize that it is a different world. It's so predatory with insects. Yeah. And, and I, so that's kind of where I, I was thinking did you were you inspired by annie dillard i guess as you're writing about insects at all she she spent you know hundreds of pages writing about insects and their sadness and yeah i've read i've read some portions of it of her sadness about a moth yeah um but no i really i i think that you can get down you can over personify you can project humanity onto them Mm -hmm. when there's something totally other going on you know, it's something very, very different than, than uh, the death of an animal. You mm-hmm. know, the death of a dog, the death of an, oh, a bird, a wolf. I think down below that is the death of a fish, you know. Mm-hmm. Like there's some, it's very different. And then below that is the death of an insect. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's all very different. It'd be easy to project a soul, a spirit, and humanity onto each of these creatures because we're very imaginative and we're you know, we're very empathetic and it's easy that way. And we make we've all kids read, shows and kids stories. Yeah, we the do cricket in Times Square. We've all read. Yeah. And so we, we, uh, amplify, you know, we, we amplify their existence and their beings when I think what they are is little critters frequently with no self-awareness at all. I don't think that they even necessarily know of their own existence, but, uh, who are functioning in a way that really tells us often more about god than the other animal life forms that we think of as higher and more complex so if you see a grizzly bear and you watch a grizzly bear and they're awesome what does this tell you about god you know if you hold a do- just a dog coming over and wanting to get scratched tells you something and you look at it. i was i was actually thinking of this this morning with one of my dogs he came over and he's being hilarious because i sat down and he just badly wants a scratch and just desperately wanting affirmation and attention and just wants the, <laughs> wants those endorphins that he's going to get from that. And, you know, and I'm looking at his teeth and his jaw and his eyes and his lines. And he's a really beautiful pointer and hilarious personality. Everybody loves him. And it's like to have invented this whole, like from nothing, to have invented this from nothing, the neediness the the furriness the super super intense affection for masterness that comes in with this is is amazing the fact that this was all invented and designed and it tells you about god but the the metaphors and the typology that show up on the insect plane in in, in the in insect world sometimes are a lot more heightened a lot easier you know it's like the like meta- go to the ant you mean yeah go to the ant you know it's like ants and grasshoppers and and Ants have one purpose in their right. life. And there's, comp- I mean, the weirdest thing to me is we get down to the simplest life forms that are, you know, we can say very, very broadly defined sentient. You know, the simplest life forms with nervous systems, right? right. In, yeah. in these little critters. And yet we have really complex societies. And God builds these really complex hive societies and right. millions societies. of millions of individuals and those big yep. termite mounds. And so you go to bees and and you realize that, you know, these beehives die in civil war, like before every winter. <laughs> it's like there's these worker bees start getting rebellious and feeding larva royal jelly and and trying to create alternate queens and other queens hatch out and everybody picks sides and they all die in this huge Russian civil war situation. It all goes Bolshevik. And then the, and then it all does this. And this isn't only in some kinds of bees, but 
then then the uh the first winter comes the the first freeze of winter comes and they all die like and then we start over we start over in the spring and look at ant wars and sidewalks and ants herding aphids and milking aphids and and you look at the metamorphosis of these enormous fat caterpillars that turn into monarchs that know the way to Mexico and really badly need to get there. And you look at the death and resurrection metaphor that exists there that's more visible. It's like we actually, God gives us, in a way he does not with large mammals, he gives us a perception into both sides of a resurrection. You know, it's like we, we actually can see the other side of the grave for caterpillars. Mm. The improvement of our next body. Yeah. Uh, an analogy for what our bodies will be like. And for all I know, that is the actual resurrection for Caterpillar. <laughs> like that's that's the right. big, I don't know that God's going to bring back every dead butterfly, you know, in, yeah. in the eschaton. There's no reason to think that he would. Not to say that he wouldn't. Maybe there's a planet that's all butterflies. I don't know. He could if he wanted to. But you sit here and look at a Caterpillar and it, there's no way around it. It dies. Like it is dead. That thing held still, it turned into soup. It is soup. And then that soup reconstitutes itself as a flying object that's brightly colored. Then I say it reconstitutes itself. It does not do it itself. Like, that's the perfect example of like having no chance of any kind of willpower that gets you there. Like, I'm going to liquefy and trust that God is then going to uh, have built in mechanisms that will cause this liquid to reconstitute itself into an entirely different entirely different yeah creature with many fewer legs <laughs> with many with many fewer legs a completely different desire a completely different diet yep the ability to fly a proboscis yeah yeah you know, this big long trunk that's a straw right super delicate velvety and basically going to turn into a flying flower is what's going to happen and i'm going to fly to mexico right and when I get there, I'm going to accidentally end up on the ground at night and die from dew. <laughs> yeah, right? Or I'm coming from Vancouver or Nova Scotia or Maine, and I actually don't have a life cycle long enough to reach that forest in Mexico where I'm supposed to go. So I'm going to die along the way, but I'm going to lay an egg, and that next generation is going to hatch, become a caterpillar, turn into soup, become the butterfly, then fly to the same forest in Mexico, somehow knowing even though which your part parents of the, which never part, made yeah. there, yeah. But which part of the journey they're on, like knowing, right, that it's gonna, this is a multi generational journey to get to this forest in Mexico, and then multi generational back, yeah, you know, to return. It's bizarre. So the insect world, I think, shows us human civilization and humanity and death and resurrection and beauty and aspiration and agony in really heightened ways where we get to sit. At almost angelic, in you know, an almost angelic position and watch. Right. When you flip that boulder. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's an angelic position and we watch, you know, this whole process and it shows us and tells us something about God that is bigger and richer and deeper than when we just watch a wolf running on the mountains. Now, a wolf running in the mountains tells you about God and it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you check out a maned wolf in South America. And just watch those things move with these psycho long legs and they, they're phenomenal. And it tells you about God. But when you watch ants, another thing I talked about in Tilt Whirl, uh, I think it was Tilt Whirl. Yeah, the earwig. Yeah. When I flipped a rock and the ants began a ritual sacrifice of earwigs in the center of the ant hill. That somebody's responsible for I was like, what on, messing everything up. What on earth? I threw the rock off to mow the lawn. And then I watch ants gather in earwigs and start to decapitate them in the center of the ant hill, and it was just weird. I mean, it was truly weird. I'm like, am I am I watching the Aztecs right now? What is this? Do they think? Do they are they aware of me? And they think that I am God, and they want me to put the put the rock back put the rock on. back. And some idiot high priest down there in that ant hill is like, do you know what we need to do? We need to sacrifice 14 earwigs. If we sacrifice 14 year wigs, you'll put the rock back. And the weird thing was I badly wanted to put the rock back. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of worked. Yeah. I mean, I had to resist. I had to harden my heart and turn my back on that ant people <laughs> and just be like, no, I'm mowing this. You idiots got out of my yard. But That's it's funny. Yeah. There's that, 
So I think that does that answer the question? I think that I think insects give us big narrative and insight into the creator and and uh, story structure and the way he works with creatures, even though they're much less. Like in much less, they tell a lot more just because it gives us a different perspective. So you don't how how much sympathy do you have for those who don't like buggies? Zero. <laughs> what what's the advice? What's the charge you like to give to them, Nate? I mean, you kind of already gave one, but. Uh... I think some people just think ew bugs are so carapacy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. They do have themselves a carapace. <laughs> yeah, two things. One is from very early. Now, I understand like the boys will be boys thing, but from a very early age I I taught my kids you may not intentionally harm anything for no reason. If you right. see an ant on the sidewalk and you see it, you step over it. You don't stomp on the ant, like period. If you step on the ant and you didn't notice, it's not a big deal. God made right. lots of them. Right. But they're amazing and God made them and they're on a quest and that little guy is like working super hard to get that dead whatever back to the ant hill to feed people. Like there's if there's no reason to crush and destroy. Right then don't do it. Yeah, that's the rule at our house too. If there's a spider inside and you need to get it out, kill yeah, it. Kill it. But yeah. if there's a spider outside, you leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, you leave the spider alone. And exactly. And so the same thing's true just because these things are made by God and it has far more to do. I don't say because they're just like you and they have a little life. You don't want to snuff it out. Uh, what I say is God made it and God loves it. And if you made that something that good, if you designed something that good, that awesome, and set it on the sidewalk and we're watching it run around, would you want your little brother to stop on it? Yeah. The answer is no, you would What's not. That evolutionary so, entomologist said, if, you know, well, the one thing we know about the creator is he has an inordinate fondness for beetles. Yeah. You know? And the fact lots that- Lots and lots of beetles. Beetles outweigh all of us by an incredible uh, amount. Yeah. And lots there's so of many of them. Yeah. Okay. And the Egyptians understood that with their, with their scarab. Their scarab symbol art. of life, right? So that's that's part one is God made them, God loves them. And that's also part two. So like part one is we aren't allowed cruelty to animals. My sons were never allowed to be cruel to snakes. My sons were never allowed right. to be cruel to anything. You no, know, like, no Sid with the magnifying glass. Yeah, you on can't you can't be Sid. Now that's not to say we're vegetarians. We're not. We will harm and kill when there is a point and purpose to it. Yeah. I have blasted magpies. You know, I have done this in my life. I have gotten rid of those magpies were thieving massive quantities of dog food. You know, it's like there's there's times I've killed a yeah. lot of mice. My do right. my dogs have killed even more mice, and that's part of why I love having them out there on you know out there on the hill where we live in the wheat fields. Like they are bloodthirsty <laughs> when it go when it comes to <laughs> mice and moles and gophers and all that kind of stuff. So. It's not to say we won't harm, we won't kill, but we, there has to be a point. There has to be a purpose to it. It can't be just mindless. And that goes for ants and that goes for spiders. That goes for everything that God made. But next phase is, who do you think you are? It's kind of the question. Mm. If you don't, you say, I don't like bugs. I don't like spiders. I don't like insects. Who the heck you darn do you think you are? <laughs> I mean, just. Because God made way more of them than you. Yeah, exactly. And and likes them. Right. God makes them and likes them. In fact, let's go further. He loves them. He loves to make them. And you want to think you're the Sunday school teacher who gets to say, ah, F, bad job, God, take them away. I have no interest in this vast corner of your museum where you put most of your artwork. <laughs> like, in fact, most of the living creatures around all yeah, of us. Yeah. So there's this, we're going to the the museum of of God's artistry and design. And you say, I would like to skip 90% of this. I want just the furry ones. Could you, could you find me the ones that are snuggleable? Because God does do some snuggleable ones. I just want to do the fuzzy ones that are, but like cute fuzzy. Yeah. I Maybe. don't want to see naked mole rats and I don't want to see right. spiders and I don't want to see. Nothing with more than four legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it blows my mind when I talk to people who, totally sweet people who just accidentally have more pride and hubris than the devil himself and you know it's it's just bizarre where we're told that the the devil tried to move his throne further north <laughs> than god's 
of whatever that means. That was a, a big trigger to the war in heaven. Um, further north, meaning further up, you know, higher, sit in judgment on, whatever, whatever it means. And I watch homeschooling moms, sweet women, best of intentions, do the exact same thing. They move their throne further north than God's. Like, I get to sit in judgment of his creation, of his artistry. I get to say, ooh, yuck. I get to say, gross God, take it away. Now, I will say, once you really get to know God well, by means of his creation, that response is not always inappropriate. There's definitely times where that's, yeah, what, that's, what, he's, that's what he's wanting. Yeah. He's going like, hey, this is the ooh, yuck. These, these are parasites. Yeah, this yeah. is the ooh, yuck section. We're talking about nose leeches and stuff like that. Yeah. You're supposed to say, ooh, yuck. You're not supposed to say, oh, yay, let's all get them. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the case. But there's a really weird and bizarre way that, that Christians have of assigning just negative aesthetic value and even evil to things that have kind of a sports car design, anything that's got those kind of angles and aggression and right is predatory. Something that can be a stuffed animal, they're fine with. Something that cannot be a stuffed animal, they're not fine with. Yeah. And that's just problematic. It's really pro- Don't ever, do not ever move your throne further north than gods. Whether you're talking about ants, spiders, earthworms, any of it. Like, just don't do it. If you believe he wants me, God wants me to kill this thing. I'm supposed to kill this. Knock it out. It's just, trying to suck the blood of my child. Yeah, do it. Go kill it. You know, I, I had a spider inside once that I was like a big one in the, in the shower. And it was uh, actually in a, in a rental house that we were in for a little while. And I, I thought to myself, I'm just going to let this play out. Let's see what happens. I like this spider. I'm going to watch. I'm going to study this spider every morning when I'm showering. Well, then like by day two or day three, actually it was massive hatch out no nope. like <laughs> enormous hatch out hundreds of this spider's babies were swarming in the shower and i had so much more work to do than if i had just <laughs> taken it out day one and that was no question a moment when i was getting laughed at you know yeah you know sort of like haha yeah you thought uh, you thought this was going to be a little object lesson yeah i was like I'm, I'm going to be francis of assisi and instead yeah. i had to turn into a yeah. holy roman crusader yeah um <laughs> And exterminate all of them. So anyway, the, the point is, imitate God. If you think God's wanting you to say, ooh, gross, and put the slug killer in your garden, I agree with you. Or the little can of beer. That's what we use. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I have no problem with that. No, I'm trying to grow, I'm trying to grow stuff here, and I'm going to police with this. With the authority of man, I'm going to police this and kill slugs. Great. You know, if there's spiders in the shower, kill them. But... This is a fantasy world crowded with fantasy animals made by a fantastical artist and engineer. And your job is to try to react the way he wants you to. So that, yeah. Be more like him and react as one of his characters, as one of his creatures in the story, react the way he wants you to. Are we going to get a riot in the dance on insects? I'd love to. I'd, yeah. love, I'd love to do insects. One of my uh, favorite BBC series is uh, Life of the Undergrowth. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's an old doc called Microcosmos but from back in the day that's also amazing. It has a great little operatic uh, theme song that sticks with me still. And I haven't watched it for probably more than a decade. And it you know, has a boy's choir voice singing, open your eyes before you die. And it's mm -hmm. great. It's fantastic. Because when you get down and you study what's going on right under your feet and on the bark of the tree and in front of your house and everything else it's it's frequently more complex and more stunning more just more astounding than anything that you'll see with the giant mammals i mean like a whale can blow your mind like this is insane but it's actually less complicated socially and metaphorically than what you're going to see in your sidewalk crack yeah slug romance for example <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah Slug romance or when two different ant colonies are having reenacting the Trojan War over a crack in your sidewalk and it's incredibly complex and the casualty rate is insane and the stakes are approximately zero, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So anyway, the, the moral here is stop being such a realist 
like look out your window and realize that you are in a fantasy world and it's not one of those like like every fantasy world ever written by a human author where they don't have time to fill in the insect life <laughs> you know it's like to, right. we like to invent elves and fairies and do stuff like that but we never get down to the roly pulleys and say and here because every human reader would be bored but we we never get down to the roly poly level and below when we're when we're designing fantasy animals for a fantasy world you live in one where the author is not lazy the author is infinite his artistry is insane and at every single level he is doing his best work at every level so his best work exists in your front yard and also with the penguins and also with the narwhal and also with the manatee and right in all those places so you live in a fantasy world don't be such a realist and then also do what you can to mortify your own instincts your own knee-jerk instincts to different you know animal life and uh try to come into alignment with where god wants you to be in your reaction yeah, view it more as as your creator does yeah yeah and i think i honestly think that um we're supposed to react to yellow jackets and hornets a certain way. We're supposed to react to spiders in the house a certain way. Like in the narrative, in the in that narrative scene, there's a reaction that's expected. Uh, right. If you've got silverfish in your house, it's all out war. They're not <laughs> supposed to be there. <laughs> get, get out. <laughs> yes. Termites. <laughs> oh, but God made them. <laughs> yeah. Nuke those things. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Kill those things dead. But anyway, that's... It's a fantasy world. You're a fantasy creature. Appreciate the fantastical at every level. We're going to have to talk more about that. That's Ryan why I dance. write insects. And that's why I love insects. And it's not because of Annie Dillard. Okay, good. It's because of my Uncle Gordon, really, which ties into Riot the Dance. We will talk more about that. And Riot the Dance being my nature documentaries. Big news on the Riot the Dance coming very, very soon. We'll have to talk about it. And with that little teaser, we're done. We're done. We're out. We talked about dragonflies. They're the best. If you enjoyed this week's episode, check out Nate's chapter, Butterfly Lies, in the book Notes from the Tilt-A-Whirl. Audiobook available now on the Canon app.